In this video I will look at the argument from family. There are two related arguments for the historicity of Jesus, them being the argument from succession and the argument from family. They both examine the very early history of the church after the supposed death of Jesus, and they both rely on several common sources. I'm inclined to treat them separately because the truth seeker wants to drill down into a particular argument to weigh its merits, whereas sophists from both sides resist doing this for arguments that don't support their position, preferring to change the subject to different arguments that do support them. Dealing with arguments one at a time frustrates this tendency and so hopefully aids objectivity. It's for this reason that I'm going to deal with the argument separately. The argument from family goes... There are a number of references both inside and outside of the New Testament to members of Jesus' family, his brothers, sisters and mother. These were historical people rather than mythical. If Jesus had historical family members, then he must have been a historical person himself. Matthew and Mark both list four brothers of Jesus, James, Joseph, Jude and Simon, and mention unnamed sisters. Here's Matthew 13, verse 54 on. Coming to his hometown, he began teaching the people in their synagogue, and they were amazed. Where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers? They asked. Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary, and aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon and Judas? Aren't all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offence at him, but Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honour except in his own town and in his own home. And he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. The same events are told at the beginning of Mark chapter 6. Jesus left there and went to his home town, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things? they asked. What's this wisdom that's been given him? What are these remarkable miracles he is performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offence at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honour except in his own town, among his relatives and in his own home. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. But the Gospels are hardly reliable history. They recount things that we know not to be true, such as miraculous events, and they contradict each other over numerous details. Paul's letters are quite different from the Gospels in this regard. Paul was a very spiritually aware person and said much about the spiritual realm, but he never once recounts an event in the physical realm which we would find unbelievable or supernatural assuming, that is, that we place the resurrection in the spiritual rather than the physical realm. He does mention signs and wonders on a couple of occasions, but does not tell us what they were. Here in Romans 15, verse 17 onwards, Therefore I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I have said and done, by the power of signs and wonders, through the power of the Spirit of God. Then in 1 Corinthians 12, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them, and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now, to each one of the manifestations of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one, just as he determines. Finally, in 2 Corinthians 12, I have made a fool of myself, but you drove me to it, I ought to have been commended by you, for I am not in the least inferior to the superior apostles, even though I am nothing. I persevered in demonstrating among you the marks of a true apostle, including signs, wonders and miracles. 
How were you inferior to the other churches except that I was never a burden to you? Forgive me this wrong. And that's it for Paul on supernatural events in the temporal or physical realm, again excluding the resurrection. So Paul was highly spiritual, yes. A hot-headed fabricator? Not really. Paul's reference to James, the brother of the Lord, is one of the most prominent references to Jesus' family members in the Bible. I previously discussed it in the context of the Silence of Paul argument, as it forms a counter to the assertion that Paul makes no reference to an earthly Jesus. The relevant text is from Galatians. This has been the subject of a large amount of debate. It's one of those texts where the superficially plain interpretation has to be knocked down by mythicists, as it would kill their theory dead. Then, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him fifteen days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that what I am writing to you is no lie. So Paul mentions a brother of Jesus, though refers to him as a brother of the Lord, and names him as James, as do the Gospels of Matthew and Mark. Paul makes another reference to Jesus' brothers without naming them, here in 1 Corinthians 9. This is my defence to those who sit in judgment on me. Don't we have the right to food and drink? Don't we have the right to take a believing wife along with us, as do the other apostles, and the Lord's brothers, and Cephas? Or is it only I and Barnabas who lack the right to not work for a living? Now, brother is one of Paul's favourite words. He addresses his readers as brothers and sisters, and uses this phrase 69 times in his genuine epistles. Aside from that, he uses the term brother a further 42 times, so in all of Paul's writings he uses the term brother 111 times, and for all of these occasions we can work out from the context that Paul is referring to brothers in Christ, or church members, not to physical brothers. There are the two exceptions just read, in which he may be referring to physical brothers of Jesus, but we have no other examples of Paul referring to physical brothers for comparison. These are, however, the only two occasions when Paul refers to a brother of the Lord. His other uses are to our brothers, or my brothers. Similarly, in the non-Pauline and disputed epistles, the word brother appears numerous times, but only rarely is it referring to a physical brother. In 1 John 3, the word is used in reference to Cain and Abel. And Jude refers to Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. All the other scores of cases where the word is used, it refers to brothers in Christ, not physical brothers. Fretting over Jesus' brothers is not unique to mythicists. Several Christian churches, including the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox, believe in the perpetual virginity of Mary, that is, that she was a virgin all her life, in which case she could not have had any other children of human fathers. The biblical references to Jesus' siblings are explained by these churches as either being step-siblings, being Joseph's children from a previous marriage, or being the children of Mary's sister and so cousins. These debates date back to the 3rd century or earlier, And consequently, there are numerous references by early Christians to Jesus' brothers and sisters, but none of these appear to have any source independent to Paul and the Gospels. The one other ancient source worth mentioning is Josephus. Here in Antiquities of the Jews, book 20, he says, And now Caesar, upon hearing the death of Festus, sent Albinus to Judea as procurator. But the king deprived Joseph of the high priesthood and bestowed the succession to that dignity on the son of Ananus, who was also himself called Ananus. Now the report goes that this eldest Ananus proved a most fortunate man, for he had five sons who had all performed the office of a high priest to God, and who had himself enjoyed that dignity a long time formerly, which had never happened to any other of our high priests. But this younger Ananus, who, as we have told you already, took the high priesthood, was a bold man in his temper and very insolent. He was also of the sect of the Sadducees, who are very rigid in judging offenders, above all the rest of the Jews, as we have already observed. When therefore Ananus was of this disposition, he thought he had now a proper opportunity. Festus was now dead, and Albinus was but upon the road, So he assembled the Sanhedrin of judges and brought before them the brother of Jesus who was called Christ, whose name was James, and some others. 
and when he had formed an accusation against them as breakers of the law, he delivered them to be stoned. But as for those who seemed the most equitable of the citizens, and such as were the most uneasy at the breach of the law, they disliked what was done. They also sent to the king, desiring him to send to Ananus that he should act so no more. Nay, some of them went also to meet Albinus, as he was upon his journey from Alexandria, whereupon Albinus complied with what they said, and wrote in anger to Ananus, and threatened that he would bring him to punishment for what he had done, on which King Agrippa took the high priesthood from him, when he had ruled but three months, and made Jesus, the son of Damnus, high priest. This is the second mention of Jesus Christ by Josephus. It is not the contested Testimonium Flavianum, of course, it is not proof of a historical Jesus. It could be a later interpolation in the text and not original to Josephus. And if it was original to Josephus, it could have come via Christians and so not be independent of the Gospels and Paul. However, it is a mention of Jesus' brother, apparently by a secular historian, and with the same name as appears in other sources. And this would be explained by the prominence of James as the leader of the Jerusalem early Christians. This is where the argument from family meets the argument from succession. The argument from succession is also an argument for historicity. I'll return to it in a future video, but in brief it goes, The death of a charismatic leader is often followed by a fight for succession, and this fight frequently involves the leader's lieutenants or family members, and is commonly between a leading lieutenant and a close family member. This is exactly what we see on the death of Jesus, where James, Paul and possibly the Pillars vied for supremacy. This scenario is typical of history, not myth, and therefore Jesus is likely to have been historical. Back to the argument from family, it is often touted as being a strong one by historicists. On plain reading it does support historicity, but is compromised by the unreliability of the Gospels as historical sources, Paul's habit of using the word brother to describe church members rather than physical brothers, and uncertainty as to the origin of Josephus' reference to James. I consider that it does support historicity, but as is so often the case, on close inspection not as strongly as is usually claimed.